try and find how God will take brokenness and make it into something beautiful because that's just the kind of God that we serve, a God that's full of sovereignty and redemption and mercy and grace and how he takes all of our scattered, messy, broken things and can create such a beautiful, beautiful thing. So that's our, my challenge for all of us this week is that we take um, what might feel broken and look for the good, look for the God in it and not necessarily pray for our circumstances to change because God determines that. But however, let's pray that our perspective on what may be broken in our life changes. And we can, instead of asking why God, we can ask what now, you know, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? What do you need me to learn? I'm willing, I'm ready. Let's do it. And I think he appreciates that so much more than when we question him and question his goodness, because even when things are broken, what is God? He's still good. The idea we have for this sermon series is for us to go to those, those very cliche sayings that we find throughout our world, even throughout the Christian world, that we kind of adopt, that we kind of say, hey, listen, I accept that. But really, if we really boil them down, um, they're kind of satanic. Um, and listen, when we attack these specific sayings, please be aware, we're in no way saying that there's no meaning in in these things at all, right? Like one of the things Jim preached about last week is the idea of celebrating diversity. That's something that we hear preached all the time around the world. And we're not, what we're not trying to say within this, uh, within this sermon series is that there's zero truth to that statement. No, there's plenty of truth to celebrating diversity, but it's when we take it to the extreme. And so when these sayings that we're talking about, we're not attacking the sayings themselves. We're, we're attacking when we take them extremely and we, we apply them absolutely in every situation because that's what happens is we begin to over embrace these ideas because they seem pretty true when really that is very toxic and very dangerous for us. So that's kind of the idea we have today. I'm going to be preaching a, preaching a sermon entitled to you, What Goes Around Comes Around? Question mark. Um, to begin, I wanted to ask you guys, anybody has ever played the game Two Truths and a Lie? Yeah, like, Two Truths and a Lie. I should have written these down beforehand. I, I didn't think about the fact that I'd freeze up in front of Okay, three truths. I have, all right, here's, here's statement number one. I have been to three different countries, all right? Statement number two, I really love pizza. Statement number three, my favorite baseball team is the Toronto Blue Jays. Does anybody know the answer to which one of those? Which, which one's the lie? Okay, number three. Number three. I am not a Toronto Blue Jays fan. Boo. Go Red Sox. Okay. But, and I mean, I, we could do this all day. I could go through so many things of two truths and a lie. And one of the reasons that I bring this up is because I think for us, um, one of the biggest issues with the Christian world and, and with the world as in general is that we are so easily bought into specific sayings or specific phrases that have partial truth within them, right? With that statement, there were two true things, but there was a lie about it. And in the same way, I believe that there's these partial truths that we believe in, right? Like the idea of celebrating diversity. Partially, that, is ve that statement is very true. We're attacking the lie that's found within it, which is over-embracing it. In the same way today, as shown by my title, today I'm going to be talking to you guys about the idea of doing good in order to receive good, or, or what the Eastern cultures would call karma. What does the Christian do with karma? Um, first off, um, I do think that there is a lot of truth to karma. I do, well, not karma in general, but to the, what I would, well, let's, first off, let's press pause. I don't like the word karma because it has Hindu and, and Buddhist background. So let's redefine it first. What I want to call it is retribution. The biblical term for quote unquote, do good, receive good is retribution, divine retribution. That is if I treat someone very well, hopefully they treat me back well, not all the time, but 
the idea is, is that it would happen. So let's redefine it. It's not karma. It's called divine retribution. The retribution principle. And the thing is, is that this is a partial truth. The idea of karma is a partial truth, but it's also, the thing about a partial truth that people don't always realize is if it's a partial truth, it also has to be a partial lie. And so I just don't want us to buy into the lie of these statements. So anytime we go through these statements for the rest of this sermon series, do know that our heart is not to attack these statements in full, but to show and to point out, hey, listen, there might be a partial lie within this statement. And so that's what I'm going to go through today, right? And the thing about divine retribution and the reason that I think we really buy into it and we really like it, to think that we do good in order to receive good, you know, if I treat others well, good things are going to come to me. The reason I think we like that is because it gives us, this truth gives us a sense of control, right? Like, if I want good things to happen to me, all I have to do is just to be a really good person and hopefully make all my paths straight and everything's fine. And that is... Quote, it's kind of true, and I'll show you some verses within the Bible to show that it is biblical, that retribution is a real thing. But did you know that I believe that control is the greatest illusion in all of the world? You have zero control. As a matter of fact, I have zero control. I could die right now. You could die right now. We have zero control, yet our whole life we're chasing after this facade of control. And the reason I think we like karma is it, it gives us a sense of ownership to what happens to us in the future. It gives us a sense of ownership to say, hey, listen, as long as I keep treating others well, good things, good blessings are going to come my way. And today I'm trying to refute that. Today I'm trying to say, listen, let's press pause and let's really dive into the scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about it. But first off, I did want to give you some examples of divine retribution within the Bible to let you know that there is some partial truth to it. So let's look in the book of Proverbs. It's all over the place. I had like over 15, 16 verses I could have chosen from that I, only I found. There's plenty more. I only picked seven, so we're going to go through them pretty quick. But just catch the flavor of these passages. Proverbs 10, 6, blessings crown the head of the righteous, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked, right? Look, righteous equals blessings, wicked equals violence. No harm overtakes the righteous, but the wicked have their fill of trouble. If I'm a righteous person, no harm will come over my way. If I am wicked, I will be full of trouble. Let's keep going. I got like seven more. The righteous eat to their heart's content, but the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. This idea of satisfaction. If I'm a righteous person, if I make good choices, then I'm going to be fully satisfied. And this says, but the wicked, if I'm wicked, then I will always be chasing after something I can't get at. And it says, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. You catching my flavors here? You like it? You see it? Let's get a couple more in here. The house of the righteous contains great treasure. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, if I'm righteous, I get financial blessing? I'm in that one, right? But the income of the wicked brings ruin. Blessed is the one who always trembles before God. Blessed. That, that word there, you can translate to say happy. Happy is the one who always trembles before God. But whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. We see this divine retribution where if I am a good person, I do get blessings. And there's one more. The one whose walk is blameless is kept safe. But the one whose ways are perverse will fall into the pit. So if we were to base our theology, if we were to base our philosophy on life upon these specific verses, and only these verses, I could understand why something like karma or something like divine retribution in its absolute, in its absolute holding would make sense, right? It just seems that if I'm a good person, good things are going to happen to me. I'll be blessed financially. I'll be kept safe. There's going to be no harm, right? You know, I have a place to live. I won't go hungry. It just sounds right. But then, oh, also, just to give you an example from New Testament, because some of y'all are probably like, well, that's Old Testament. Well, let me give you a New Testament one, okay? New Testament, Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. This is Paul talking to the church in Galatia. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Listen, divine retribution is a real thing. So when you do good things, good things will come your way. But not every single time. It's not, an, it's not, it's not every single time you do good things, good things are going to happen to you. It's not that way. So I'm not attacking the statement in general. I'm attacking the extreme. 
where we, we come into these situations in our life where something bad happens and we try to figure out why. It's the question that never goes away for us as, as pe- not only Christians, but people. It's like, why is this bad thing happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Is there, did I sin and yet not repent? Is there something that God's trying to show me in myself that I need to get rid of? It's, it's just a, it's a bad question to be asking because sometimes some things happen to you for no good reason. And so I have, while there is certainly truth to the rest of retribution principle, I have three examples of why quote-unquote karma can't be true, can't be 100% true. First off is real life experiences. I don't even have to go to the Bible for this one. I'm just going to talk out a testimony here. Way, all right, way too many bad things, way too many bad things happen to good people and way too many good things happen to bad people for me to believe in such a thing as karma. I know some amazing godly people who, if you were to put them on the scale of spirituality with me, I would be way up. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got so much weight. They have spirituality, man. They know all the Bible. They got them all memorized. But for some strange reason, it's almost as if knowing so much more Bible brings them more bad luck, by the way. Luck. Oh, I hate that word, too. But anyway, so there's, there's just way too many bad things happen to bad people. And that's why the question always comes, why? We always ask the question why, because we think we have some kind of troll. We think that God's trying to punish us, or God's trying to get our attention, and it's not true. Sometimes bad things just happen to you. Um, I have a good example here. This just happened, and uh, Jania went to school with a lady named Jaren. Jaren is a great woman, a godly woman. Jaren Norton, a really good friend of hers, a really good friend of mine, and she just had a baby. And not only did she just have a baby, it was two months ago, she had a baby. She almost died having this baby. Went into preeclampsia. Her heart was functioning at 30%. Almost didn't make it, but she did. She made it. And uh, two weeks ago, out of nowhere, her baby died. Her baby passed away. They're not sure of why. Uh, they haven't. They're trying to rule out everything before they say it's SIDS, but probably going to be said, but I think for some of us, and this is what I don't understand. I'm at this funeral, right? I'm, we're there and I'm just trying, you know, I'm listening to people talk to her and they're all just like saying all these things like, well, you know, even this poem in this, this little pamphlet, it just talked about how God wanted her baby in heaven. And I just wanted to throw the, I wanted to crumble up, throw it and be like, that's a bunch of BS. God did not want her baby. Guess what? God did not kill her baby. God cried just as much as she did. God is mourning just as much as she did. The reason that baby died was because of sin. And I don't think it had anything to do with with Jaren. It had nothing to do with her. But what happens is when we come into these crazy catastrophic moments in our lives where things get thrown all out of whack, we start blaming ourselves. We start thinking, oh gosh, what have I done to deserve this? And that's not the way it's supposed to go. Way too many bad things happen to really good people. And that's what pushes everyone away from the church is because people in the church, something bad happens to them and they say, well, there's probably a sin you need to repent of. I've seen so many people, I've heard a lot of stories of people leaving the church because something bad happens to them and then someone says, well, you have a sin that you're not telling us about and you have to repent of it lest you continue to suffer. And that's a bunch, can I just say, I have a nice theological word for that, hogwash. It's hogwash. That's not true. It's not true. Get that stinking thinking out of there. Sometimes bad things happen because of sin. Not having anything to do with you. Not having anything to do with your actions. It just happens. Real life experience. You can't try to explain. We're people who just want to know everything. Why something happened. You can ask, seek, knock all you want. But guess what? Sometimes you just got to come to the conclusion that I do not know And that it probably happened for no good reason than the fact that there is sin in this world. That should be enough. Real life experiences give me an example as to why karma can't be true. So while I just read all those things that said if you are righteous, if you are living right, blessings will come your way. Yet do we think a a mother losing her baby is a blessing? I don't think so. And then that's what people say. They're like, well, it's going to be a blessing one day. It's going to be. No, it's going to be hurt the whole time. It's not ever going to. I mean, 
you can help others with it, right? We can use it as a, as a means, a tool for ministry. When we meet somebody who's going through the same thing, yeah, we can redeem it. We can redeem it. There's no doubt about it. Yes, it can be a blessing to others. But at the end of the day, I've known people, great Christian people, who at the end of their life, they say, I still don't know why. I still don't know why. So can I just say, when bad things happen to people around you, don't try to figure it out with them. Don't try to say, oh, let's, let, you know, let's seek and ask God why this happened. Just listen. The Bible literally says, weep with those who weep. The best thing you can do for somebody sometimes is just cry with them. Don't say anything. Why do we always have to say something? Trust me, and that's hard for me. I'm a talker. I'm always trying to talk. But I've learned in a very short amount of time that sometimes I just have to shut up and not think. As a matter of fact, I believe trying to figure out every little thing as to why something's happened to me is, is the root of all sin, right? Listen, when Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to be like God and know everything. And so what we do is we just, it's the same way we bite the fruit. It's the same way we take, we pluck it off the tree every time we try to figure out why. It is a healthy question. I'm not saying we have to just like accept everything as is. There is a time of mourning and there is a, there's times for those things. But let's not try to answer it. Let's not try and answer it, okay? Okay, so I've made this <coughs> statement. Now I want to turn from real life experiences to the book of Job. E example number two is the book of Job. And um, I'm going to show you a picture here up on this screen, and I'm going to tell you a little about it. The book of Job is a very strange thing. Did you know the book of Job is the oldest, by far, the, I mean really far, by far the oldest book in the Bible. I mean really old. I don't even have a, a date. I forgot to write it down. But it is the oldest book in the Bible. So Technically, it's the first thing written, and I find it so crazy that we, we see the book of Job, and it's such a poetic book. If you've never read the book of Job, you need to get in that junk. That stuff is so good, but it's a story of a man. If you don't know, I'm just going to give you a little background. It's a story of a man who God himself, in the scriptures, call him righteous and blameless. Say that there's no offensive way in this man. So think about this idea of who... He who is righteous, Job is the epitome of this guy. Doesn't mean he was sinless, it just means he had some type of faith through grace that made him righteous in God's sight, okay? So I just want to make sure we get that right. But the thing is, is within this story, it's a story where Satan comes to God and says, hey, listen, you know, I've been looking to and fro, blah, 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 and then looking for somebody to devour. And then God even mentions Job by name and says, have you considered my faithful servant Job? And so what happens is that Satan makes a deal with God and says, let me take, you know, the only reason he's worshiping you, the only reason he's righteous, the only reason he's blameless is because you give him everything he wants. Of course he's happy and nice and good. And so what happens is God says, okay, well, you can, you can, you know, kill his family. So kill, you know, kill his family and then comes back. He says, you can make him ill. You can do anything. And then it comes back a third time. He says, you can do whatever you want to him. Just don't take his life. And so we hear, that's the first three chapters of Job. So it's a crazy story. But the rest of the time we see this battle. Um, we see this battle. And what I call this is I call this the triangle of tension within the book of Job, right? There's these three specific truths that we can see these the, the people within the book uh, really battle with, right? Because back in ancient Near East, also even in Jewish culture, they held really tightly to this idea of divine retribution, right? That if you were a rich person or that you had many blessings, it's because you were righteous in God's sight. And in the same way, if you were, if you were diseased, if you were outcasted, you were unrighteous. You were, you were disgusting in the sight of God, right? I mean, you can even see that within the, the New Testament. I don't have this, this up here, but when Jesus talks about the rich man, right, and the rich man getting into the kingdom of heaven, what does he say? He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to get into heaven, right? And then what do the disciples say? They look all at each other. They're super confused, right? And they said, well, who then can be saved? Now, why would they ask that question after hearing about the rich man entering into heaven? It's because the Jews saw that if you were rich, you were righteous in the sight of God. So it made no sense if the rich guy can't get into heaven, then who could? Because obviously because he's rich, he is righteous and God loves him. And he's got God's favor on him. It would only make sense. 
that he would get into heaven. But no, for them, they were super confused because God said, no, you're not getting into heaven, which means that this idea of divine retribution was questioned by Jesus and opposed by him. And so the ancient Near East culture was the same way. And so they, this is the three truths that we see. The triangle of tension without, throughout the whole book of Job that they're constantly struggling with, right? Because even God himself says that Job is righteous, right? And many times throughout the book, Job continually claims his innocence. And then we all know that God is just. God has to be just unless, unless he's not God. And then he's not just. But he is God, and so he has to be just. And then you have... In the bottom left corner, the retribution principle. And so Job is visited by his three friends. Does anybody know his three friends' names? I'll give you, a, I'll give you some candy if you can know these three's names. I mean, they're really hard. Nobody? Okay. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. He's got three friends. You would have never guessed that, right? Unless you sneeze and actually said them. You probably could. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably be closer than what you'd actually say. Anyway, so here's these three friends, right? And what happens? As soon as all these things happen to him, they come and they join him. And guess what they do? They sit in silence for seven days. They should have stopped there. They should have just left after that. But what happens in the rest of the book of Job, because, well, that's only till chapter three, for 37 plus chapters, all they do is rip Job to shreds. In dealing with these three truths, right? Job is constantly in his pleas to God and his pleas to his friends. Listen, I am innocent. I do not know what God is doing. And so what happened is Job is kind of questioning God's justice because he knows that he's been a good person and so good things should be happening to him. But all of a sudden, his health is taken away. His family is taken away. All of his possessions are taken away. And he's empty-handed and he's so confused because he said, if the retribution principle is true, that good things happen to good people, then what is going on? There might be something going on with God. Maybe he isn't just. And so he's starting to question God. He's, and listen, there's nothing wrong with questioning God. There's nothing wrong with questioning him. Right. We uh, I can even think about I can even think about Jesus. Right. You know, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he questions. He's like, hey, listen, like if there's any other way for me to save these people other than death on a cross, you know, take this cup from me, which is the cup of wrath. But guess what? Jesus kind of is like last last ditch effort. OK, God, let's come up with a different way. But then he doesn't. He, Jesus never sinned. So it's OK for us to to disagree or to question God. It's not OK for us to. Um, choose another way but so he's starting to question he's not questioning in a sense of like I think God is unjust he's saying he must be right if if all these three things are true then one of well one of them has to be right two truths and a lie see it two truths and a lie which one's a lie which one's a lie and so the whole time Job is saying well I know that I'm righteous I know that I'm innocent as told by God in the story if you read it he says and I and I he's He's questioning retribution. He thinks, he holds that retribution principle is truth. And so he starts to question God. He's like, but I know God has to be true. It's, he's just. God has to be just. So maybe retribution principle is not. And that's where it all begins. So his three friends, his three friends are just trying so hard to tell him otherwise. See, his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, say, hey, listen, yeah, you're right, there is two truths, one lie, but the lie is that you're righteous. And we can see that in these next verses. There's a lot of verses we're about to cover, so just buckle in and be ready, but I'm not going to take talk too long on them. But let's look at their, what they say. This is in, I think, Job 4. This is when Eliphaz, Eliphaz speaks. And he says, then Eliphaz, the Temanite, replied, if someone ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking. Think how you have instructed many and how you have strengthened, strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. So what is he saying about Job? You're a pretty righteous dude. You've done a lot of good things. You've strengthened feeble hands. You've supported those who stumbled. You've strengthened faltering knees. You've instructed people. He's giving, he's giving Job some positivity. saying, yeah, you've done a lot of these things because Job just got talking about how he was innocent. And he says, and then verse 5, it switches. He says, but now trouble comes to you and you are discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence? You see what he's talking about here? He's saying, all these good things I just said, shouldn't that be your confidence and your blameless ways, your hope? Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? 
Where were the upright ever destroyed? Do you see the idea that they're, they're showing here, this divine retribution principle? As good, if you're a good person, good things will happen. You'll never be destroyed. You'll never perish. As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God, they perish. At the blast of His anger, they are no more. Basically what Eliphaz is saying, hey, listen, bro, you think that you're righteous. You think that you're good, but if you were, then you wouldn't be perishing because it would be your confidence and your hope that you were righteous, but because you aren't, because you're not innocent, you're perishing and you're being destroyed. And it's saying, listen, you're reaping what you're sowing, you're sowing what you reap. You reap what you sow right here in verse 8. So he's basically saying, hey, Job, you're not, you're, there's something you're not telling us. There's some sin you're not telling us about. We see your good deeds, but there has to be some specific sin. Otherwise, this stuff wouldn't be happening to you. You guys see that? Yeah. To give you a little bit more, let's go on. And this is when Bildad speaks. He says, then Bildad, the shoe height, <laughs> replied, how long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. This is when Job had just got done talking to God, yelling at God. Not yelling, but like kind of conversing with him, trying to figure out what's going on, talking about his innocence. He says, does, jo does God pervert justice? That top truth, God is just, right? Does the all matter pervert what is right? The answer obviously rhetorically is no, he does not. When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to their penalty of their sin. But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. He's saying, listen, bro, just repent of the sin that you're not telling us about. Obviously, there's some sin unmentioned. They constantly keep questioning out of the three true, the two truths and a lie. He's saying, obviously, you being righteous is the, is the false thing because we know retribution principle to be true and that God is just. So you have to be the lie. You have to be the lie. True truths and a lie. Your beginnings will seem humble and so your prosperous will be your future. Now let's just go one more time to Zophar. Zophar has to talk. Are all these words to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? Will your idle talk reduce others to silence? Will no one rebuke you when you mock? You say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I am pure in your sight. See? And by the way, every time one of the friends says something, Job is answering back to them. So that's what he's talking about. You keep saying that you're, you're sinless, but you're not. And then it says, oh, how I wish that God would speak and that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom, for true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. You're so sinful, God's even forgotten some, but you still deserve this. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. If he comes along and confides you in prison and convenes a court, who can oppose him? Surely he recognizes deceivers. That's what he's calling them. He's saying, you're a deceiver. And when he sees evil, does he not take note? But the witless can no more become wise than the wild donkey's colt can be born human. Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then free of fault you will lift up your face. You will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as water's gone by. Life will be brighter than new day, and darkness will become like morning. Is there more? You will be secure because there is hope. You will look about you and take your rest in safety. You will lie down with no one to make you afraid, and many will court your favor. But the eyes of the wicked will fall, fail, and the escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying grass. Do you, do you, you catch in their flavors here? Wow, right? Like these, they're basically saying, bro, you just need to repent. If you just repented of the sin that you're not mentioning to us, we're not, you know, you can just, you, God will restore you. You just got to realize you've done something wrong. And that's exactly what we do, don't we? When something bad happens to us, when bad things come along, we just say, oh God, what have I done? Whatever it is I repent of. Guess what? Sometimes it doesn't work that way because we're about to see what Job says and we're about to be, and we're about to see um, some other things. So let's continue. Um, I think Job talks here. Then Job replies, he's being, by, by the way, verse 2, he's being very sarcastic. So let's read it in a sarcastic tone. Doubtless you are the only people who matter and wisdom will die with you, right? Mm. But I have a mind as well as you and I am not inferior to you. Who does not know all these things? I have become a laughingstock to my friends, though I called on God and he answered, a mere laughingstock, though righteous and blameless. He's saying, listen, I don't care what you guys say. I'm blameless. Those who are at ease have contempt for misfortune. 
as the fate of those whose feet are slipping. So he's saying, listen, the people who are, those who are at ease have contempt for misfortune. So those people, and then he says, the tents of the martyrs are undisturbed and those who provoke God are secure. Those God has in his hand. He's saying, listen, I don't know what you're seeing, but what I see is that evil people, tent of martyrs, those are bad people, are undisturbed and those who provoke God, we don't want to be provokers of God, are secure. Those God has in his hand. Now Job is saying, listen, there's something wrong with the retribution principle. There's something wrong with good brings out good and bad brings out bad. There's something wrong there. The two truths is that God is just and that I am innocent, but the retribution is false because I am blameless. So his three friends, after arguing for 30 chapters, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, I would have probably thrown a stone at them, just took them out. But anyway, What's really sad is there's this third guy, or fourth guy who comes along, who's named Elihu, right? So we see this idea of us, you know, something bad happening to us, and we're like, man, what, God, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What is going on? What have I done to deserve this? I need to repent. I need to fix this. But then we have another group of people who push another message down our throat, and these are the Elihus of your life. And this is what Elihu says. He comes up in chapter 34, but I believe we're, is that the chapter? Yeah, chapter 34. And he says this. <clears throat> he says a lot more because this is verse 31, but I already knew that I read a lot of verses, so I try to condense. Elihu says, suppose someone says to God, I am guilty, but will offend no more. That's repenting, by the way. Teach me what I cannot see. If I have done wrong, I will not do so again. That's repentance. 31, 32 is basically saying if you repent. Should God then reward you on your terms when you refuse to repent? You must decide, not I, so tell me what you know. Talking about God, asking God, what do you know? And so what Elihu doing, there's those people in our lives who are saying, hey, listen, this thing is happening because of a previous sin that you have committed that you have not repented of. And then there's the other groups of people, the Elihus in your life that come to you and say, hey, listen, perhaps this bad thing is happening to you. Because God is trying to reveal a sin that you're unaware of. And that's not true either, by the way. That's not true either. Sometimes bad things just happen. Because we know from what God says about Job is that he is righteous. And we know God is just. So the whole time this dialogue, for us, we look at this text and say, well, duh. It obviously makes sense that Job is righteous because God said so and that God is just because we know God to be. It obviously means the two truths are the top and the right and the bottom one has to be a left. But these people don't understand that. They're learning it for themselves through this experience. And so that's what this whole battle is for. The whole book of Job is trying to, what do I do with this retribution principle when bad things happen to a really good person? You throw it out. It's a lie. Two truths and a lie. Um... So that's my defense out of the book of Job. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so, you know me, I like life experiences. I like Old Testament. So now let's go to the New Testament. Got a good example for you as to why karma can't be true. Why good things happening to good people can't be true. And listen, if you can't get on board with this, well, then you can hop off the ship because this is good stuff. Let's read 2 Corinthians. I don't know why there's no two there. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, there's the two. I see it over there. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Hey, listen. Did you know that the cross crushes karma? Write it down. Just write it down right now. Because I'm about to explain to you something. The cross the cross absolutely crushes karma. Because if you think about it, if you really understand the gospel, you realize that the worst thing, which is undeserved death on a cross, happened to the best person. Literally, the perfect person. God in the flesh. So that the best things, the blessings, the inheritance, the eternal life, could happen to the worst people. People like me and you. People like me and you. Do you not understand that the, without... Without the cross, we, if, we want, if we want what we deserved, if we wanted what we, what we earned in life, we'd all be in hell. I don't want that. I am so grateful that the gospel crushes karma. The, the gospel is the antithesis of do good, receive good. It's the antithesis. Christ took on the bad so that we could get the good. Get the, good. the worst thing 
undeserved death happened to the best person, the perfect person, Jesus, God incarnate, God in the flesh, so that the worst people could get the best things. Amen. I love that. If, I mean, if you need more convincing, you can come talk to me, but I mean, that is, that is just true gospel. And as I, as I close, I just want uh, to bring out these, these two parts um, of the gospel that I love. Um, it's the word mercy and the word grace. Mercy and grace are two things which make no sense in the world of karma. Because, well, I've def- they define it this way. I don't think they're 100% naturally true, like necessarily true, but I do believe that there is some truth to them. Mercy for us is not getting what we do deserve. Okay? Not getting what we do deserve, which is the opposite of karma, right? And grace is getting something we don't deserve, which is the opposite of karma. So, if we're going to be people who live a life that's filled up by mercy and by grace, that which is the antithesis to karma, that we do good in order to receive good. Now don't forget, there is some truth to that. But if we're going to live as people of mercy and people of grace, we have to get that out of us. We have to get the the idea that I can control something about me. Mercy and grace are the antithesis of karma. They're the antithesis of thinking that I can make good things happen to me. Bad things happen to good people all the time. Grace and mercy. Thank you, God, for those. Thank you, God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. And we thank you that he came to this earth. You came to this earth through him. That he was God in the flesh. That he was was sinless. He was perfect. Yet, He took on the worst death, an undeserved death, a painful, excruciating death so that we, the worst people, could have the best things, the inheritance of a kingdom in heaven, the the blessings that we get to endure every day, the blessing of grace and the blessing of mercy and the blessing of love and the blessing of favor. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that the cross crushes karma and that... You are so much greater. God, I just pray for anyone here who might be having something bad happening to them or going through a lot of questioning season, God, that they can, they can just come to you and trust in you and know that sometimes bad things just happen. They just happen because sin is in the world. We not, God, I just pray that you help us get away from the spirit where we try to explain everything. You help us get away from the spirit where we want to know why everything is happening to us. God, that we can just lay it at your feet and trust you. And God, that we could be people who come alongside those who are in these moments and we can't, we don't point fingers and say, well, where is your sin? What sin is it that you haven't repented of God? But we can just come to beside them and that we can mourn with them, weep with them, share their burden, and instead try to point something out of them and say, you need to fix this. It's not what it's about. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to experience your mercy and to experience your grace and how glorious it is. It's an amazing thing. And we thank you that it stands in exact opposition of this idea of what goes around comes around. We thank you that you are sovereign and that you are in control and that you just want to be a good father of us and you want to give us perfect things, not because we've earned it, not because we're awesome, but because you're awesome and that you're good and that you're just and that you do all these things on our behalf because of Christ. And we thank you for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.